Welcome to the lockdown episode seven. My name is Sanna Lachers and I'm here today with Jeremy Krollsmith uh, and our guest of today is Henner Busch. Uh, he is a researcher at Lund University in Sweden at the Department of Human Geography and the Center for Sustainability Studies. Um, so the corona crisis has been compared to many crises from the past. It's been compared to the Spanish flu, to SARS, to AIDS and the financial crisis of 2008. Um, but today, however, we compare it to a crisis that we're right in the middle of, that is the environmental crisis, the, the climate crisis. Um, many parallels have been drawn between how the corona crisis um, might actually be a pressure cooker, more urgency driven version of how we are dealing and will deal in the future with the climate crisis. And in both cases, politicians have blatantly ignored, ignored science based advice of experts. So there's this huge disconnect between science and political decision making. But we also see that um, the impact of both crises are undeniably discriminatory and their consequences are deeply unequally and unfairly distributed, damaging those who already are vulnerable most and first. And its solution requires fundamental systemic change. But besides the similarities um, between how these crises are developing, these are also crises that impact one another. So we can see that uh, on the one hand, the origin and development of viruses such as these is actually connected to how we currently engage with the natural world and the species in it. So we can see how unsustainable practices regarding animal handling contributes to the situation that we are in now. On the other hand, this very situation is actually considered a chance to address environmental issues, such as that the International Energy Agency recently said that the prospect is that the world will actually use 6% less energy than the year before, which is actually an equivalent to losing the entire energy demand of India. At the same time though, many consider the classic case of what Naomi Klein would call disaster capitalism, in which a crisis is used to, push, used to push through legislative or otherwise changes that would usually meet great resistance, such as the recent bailout of the oil and gas industry in Alberta. So it's very clear that there are many levels on which these two big topics are connected. And today we try to unravel some of that. Um, and I'm not doing that alone, I'm doing that with Jeremy and Henner. Uh, but before we introduce Henner to you, um, Jeremy, do you have some thoughts to share uh, on this topic and some other recent uh, events? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sana. I, I do. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, this, this recording will be talking mainly about uh, uh, the environment, environmentalism. Um, but I, I think we can't carry on without um, briefly mentioning um, the events in the United States, um, the rebellion of the movement for black lives after the murder of George Floyd. So first of all, I think uh, we should share our solidarity and love to all the people on the barricades facing down the deadly police uh, violence and the crackdown. Yeah, so we'll be giving this topic um, the, the attention it deserves uh, in a future recording. But for now, I think I'd like to share um, what we can learn from, uh, from this movement and from the events happening and un unfolding as we speak in the US and around the world. Namely, um, the idea of the negotiation by riot. So this might seem like a strange concept, but bear with me. Um, yeah, I want to, I want to um, run through what, what this uh, rebellion has achieved uh, within slightly more than two weeks at the point of this recording and what the black president and the black attorney general have not been able to achieve after two terms. So, uh, yeah, I, I found this list online somewhere and I'll share it uh, in, the, in the show notes. But I'm just going to read uh, a, few, a few points that have been, uh, been achieved so far. So George Floyd's killer has, uh, was fired, uh, arrested and charged with um, third degree murder. Subsequently, the charge was upgraded and the other three cops involved as accomplices were also charged. General consciousness around policing and racism has shifted dramatically with 54% of Americans supporting the protests and the burning down of a police uh, precinct. This makes burning down of a police station more popular than both Trump and more popular than Biden. 
a veto-proof majority in a Minneapolis police council has uh, pledged to take steps to disband the Minneapolis police department. This would not abolish the police in Minneapolis, but it is a tremendous opening for the struggle to reduce policing and institute alternatives. The Minneapolis school board has ended a contact, uh, the contract with police, a victory for um, the wider cops out of school movement, something that is a thing for some strange reason in the United States, as well as um, uh, other um, institutions have uh, broken ties with police, including University of Minnesota, Minnesota Parks and Recreations, Portland, Oregon Public Schools. The state of Minnesota has filed a civil uh, lawsuit against the police department. Mayors of Los Angeles, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles announced that the uh, city's police budget would be cut by 100 to 150 million to be reinvested in um, better conditions for black residents. In New York, uh, it was also announced uh, that they're going to shift budget away from police to youth programs. Uh, Louisville temporary susp temporarily suspended the no-knock warrants, the kind of warrant that was used uh, by police to kill Brianna Taylor and took steps towards in, in banning, the, uh, banning the practice entirely. Transit unions in Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, Washington DC, and Boston refused to transport protesters arrested by police. And in Minneapolis, Boston, and Pittsburgh, they, were actually, they actually refused to transport police themselves. Furthermore, statues honoring slave owners' reactionary cause, uh, originally raised as a reaction to the civil rights movement, have been removed by local governments or by direct action in Richmond, Virginia, Birmingham, Montgomery, Alexandria, Virginia, and Baltimore. In the UK, uh, a statue of a slave trader in Bristol was tossed into the sea. Um, cracks have developed uh, in the US military with growing resistance among soldiers being uh, deployed to suppress uh, the protests. Los Angeles Pride announced that the Pride Parade this year would be reinstated as the Black Lives Matter protest. Indianapolis Pride announced uh, they will not have police at the Pride events. Cops out of Pride, something uh, that should happen in Amsterdam and other cities in the Netherlands as well. National, the National Football League has made a decision to allow the kneeling protest by players, something that's long overdue. Uh, a Denver judge is, uh, issued a restraining order limiting the use of tear gas and rubber bullets something that has actually been just been passed uh, by the Dutch uh, second, second Chamber, um, which will allow Dutch police to now shoot at protesters. Um, officials from both parties in Congress in the US uh, were forced to announce uh, the initiation of a process to, limit, to place limits on the, on the 1033 program, which funnels military equipment to local police departments. So just starting to demilitarize the police. And last and least, the Fuji, Fuji bikes suspended the sale of bicycles to police departments. <laughs> what a victory. So for those of you in the Netherlands where we're, we're recording this, uh, that think that this is a uniquely American affair, think again. Um, our preeminent scholar of Dutch radical movements, Dennis Bos, has often talked and written about this, the idea of negotia negotiation by riot and how it has shaped and formed uh, progressive movements in the Netherlands um, in the last few centuries. Environmental, environmentalists can learn a lot from these events, especially um, those that like to get on their high horse and extol the virtues of purely nonviolent protests. Yes, I'm thinking of you, Extinction Rebellion. Anyway, on to my next topic. I want to talk about a uh, scary tendency in the Green Movement um, that has been gaining steam since the, uh, the onset of the coronavirus, namely the idea of the human virus. So this is a common trope that you can read all over the place and it's not, uh, it's not marginal at all. It's uh, pushed by large philanthropic institutes like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and prominent environmentalists like Richard Attenborough. You might you might have heard similar ideas and the lines in uh, the new Michael Moore documentary, Planet of the Humans. Aside from 
other problematic aspects of this film, uh, which I won't go into here, um, one of the central messages is this. The humans are the problem. There are too many of us. We are the virus. In the context of the corona crisis, we've all seen memes about nature restoring itself. Uh, thanks to corona, finally, nature is fighting back. As, as long as uh, humans get out of the way, nature will, which will, will find a way. On the surface, of course, this, this seems like a nice thought, but underneath festers a very nasty assumption about human nature and about the real causes of our problems. Humans seem to be the problem. Humans are the virus. Their message is clear. The biggest problem of our time is that there are too many people on this earth. This way of thinking is also called neo-Malthusianism. So what's wrong with this thought? It lays the blame at our, uh, for our problems at the feet of human nature, of, at civilization's door. It gives our economic system and the current institutions, uh, and sorry, it gives it lays the blame at the feet of human nature, of civilization, and gives our economic system, the current institutions, and violent history a pass. Of course, it's also racist as hell, because uh, it's not that there are too many white people. No, no. It's the Africans that are breeding too much, and it's killing us all. This is complete bullshit, of course. If you look at the facts, there is enough food to go around. It's just our economic system that doesn't distribute the food according to need, but according to means. If you have the money, you get fed. If not, it's your own fault. You know, you should have should just have started your own microfinance business and pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps instead of choosing to starve. What's killing us, in actual fact, is our economic system, which makes it more profitable for iPhones to last for two years uh, through planned obsolescence than to make it real durable products. What's killing us is nature, uh, seeing nature as a resource rather than something we humans, rather than something we human animals are an integral part of. What's killing us is an econo economic system that needs endless growth or dies. The system is starving people to death each year, sacrificing them and on the altar of economic common sense, and then blames, blames those same people for, um, by telling them they should just have made less babies. And by some coincidence, the problem, the problem people all seem to be black or brown. Not those living beyond uh, the limits uh, of, of nature, um, of the planet in the global north. If we look at the footprint on the natural environment of rich countries in the north and compare it to developing countries, uh, the root of the problem is clear. It's us and our economic system, capitalism, that we forced on the rest of the world through conquest, genocide and assimilation. In conclusion, the human virus is a right-wing myth that has always found sympathetic, in the, sympathetic ears in the more misanthropic tendencies in the green movements. We should reject it for what it is, a racist and reactionary straw man that if not countered will lead the green movement down a road to eco-fascism eco and away from a society where humans learn to live in harmony with our environment. So think about this. What's the one thing that's worse than a right-wing climate denier? a right-wing climate activist. <laughs> so. Thanks for sharing your thoughts, uh, Jeremy. I think it's, it's very clear that we, at the moment, are in many crises at the same time, right? And you can see how they are very connected, how racism is connected to the climate crisis, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, it's inter interesting and very important to see that these are not isolated events that are actually very connected. Um, and we're going to talk about some of these connections today with Henner as well. So um, Henner Bush is, uh, as I said, he's a researcher at uh, Lund University and uh, has an interest in uh, energy justice, energy transitions, and also um, urban climate uh, management uh, and governance. Um, so Henner, welcome. Hi, thanks Hi. for having me today. Hey, how are you uh, handling the corona lockdown? Um, I would say for us it was great. Um, we moved uh, in early uh, March and we had a lot of time to set up our apartment and do the home fixing stuff and that is just an expression of the incredible privilege that we basically have in our lives. Um, as two people who can 
uh, opt out of going to office, um, who can do home office, um, who are not, you know, driving buses or cleaning uh, other people's dirt away. Um, so, uh, yeah, for us, it was good. Of course, I mean, what you miss is the, the human interaction that you have. Um, but this has been a walk in the park compared to many other people. Yeah, yeah that's a good thing to realize also. Yeah. yeah. So um, I mentioned um, uh, earlier um, that some people see this crisis uh, as a chance and some as a threat. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, today we specifically talk about how it can be a chance and a, a threat um, to a more or less sustainable world. Um, what is your take on this? How do you see it as a threat, as a dismantling of the environmental project? Or how do you see it as a possible chance? Right. So uh, I think we should start off with a disclaimer and saying like whatever. And I think uh, the, the introduction was very, very much in, the, in, in line with that. Um, I think it's uh, what Corona does is kills people. And, and that is not good. Um, and that is a horrible thing. Um, and uh, it might also cripple people. It affects the life of people. It rips away the livelihoods of people. Um, so it creates a lot of sorrow. So um, human suffering and if we in the next, I don't know, 45 minutes or, six minutes or so say something about this being a chance or this being um, something positive or having positive um, side effects, we always have to keep this in mind, right? So uh, in its basis, in its essence, it is something very, very destructive that none of us can with a good conscience in any way endorse. Yeah, I completely um, agree. Great. <laughs> um, then, um, yeah, I mean, uh, is it a chance? Is it a threat? It's both at the same time, of course. Um, things are complex. And I think what the corona crisis shows us very clearly right now, especially, especially also when we look at the aspect of A, health, and B, environment, um, that it pays out to go to uh, elections and don't vote for populists. Um, I guess this is this is one of the main lessons we can we can draw out of this. I mean, if we look at which countries have performed uh, the worst, um, Brazil, U.S., uh, U.K., uh, where it's going really really badly. Sweden also for other reasons, but um, places where it's going really badly. Those are places that have, uh, um, in many ways, yeah, populist leadership. And, and that's just not good for the people. But it's also not good for the environment. Um, and this is, I think, very much related to the question of how do we respond to this crisis, right? Um, the more populist your government is, I guess the, the, the shittier the crisis response will be. How do you see this translating in um, environmental um, projects that have been um, started or legislation that mm -hmm. has been passed before? And how is it impacting that now? Right. Um, so, I mean, if we, for example, look at the at the United States, we see that the Trump administration has, of course, used the, the current situation to dismantle a lot of uh, environmental legislation um, from the Obama era. It seems, I read, uh, read an interesting article about that, it seems that this is a private revenge project by Donald Trump to take revenge on Obama and dismantle his political projects and part of that is the environmental legislation that has been passed. Um, we see the same in Canada where we had the energy minister of Alberta saying well this is the ideal time to um, push the construction of all pipelines and, and push fossil fuel product, um, projects because at this time um, there will be less attention devoted to it. Um, so yeah there's definitely a threat um, in terms of legislation that might be um, um, dismantled during this time. It is also a threat in that we might see very different stimulus packages coming there as a crisis response from governments. Um, that's very, very important that we actually look at what's, what's in these stimulus packages. Um, it is very much about the question who's gaining uh, in this situation. It's also very much about this question, what systems are we preserving through stimulus packages? So what is it a crisis of and what do we want to carry over to a post-crisis society? Um, that, is a, that is an essential question. Um, 
but also of course the question what do we let die in in this in this uh, situation and yeah can you elaborate a bit on who mm-hmm. by what you see happening now who who yeah. is gaining and what what are we actually preserving what we want to stabilize a society from this crisis but what is actually that thing what are we stabilizing that is the question we should all ask ourselves what are we stabilizing are we what 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 is it we're investing into? So, for example, if we look at the U.S. again, and sorry that I'm using the U.S. over and over as the as kind of a negative example, but I do so because I read up on the case. So, what we saw is that each um, household, to my knowledge, got a handout of a thousand two hundred dollars um, to deal with the impact of the crisis on the individual level. At the same time, we see bailouts um, going, especially to uh, fossil fuel producers in the billions. So there we see what's being preserved is an economic system or economic activity that's based on fossil fuels. Um, we see bailouts um, for airplane uh, companies, what do you say, airlines. Um, we see bailouts, um, yeah, for very destructive industries. So of course there are jobs behind that. And of course, if, if people, if these airlines close down, there will be jobs lost. And that, that's, that's a tragedy. It is an individual tragedy for a household if a job is lost. It's an individual tragedy for a person when they lose their job. It is an individual tragedy if a coal mine closes down and you've been working in a coal line, mine for 30, 40 years and your identity is built around being a coal miner. I understand that. Um, but we also have to take into consideration that if we do these things, we might also lock ourselves in for another 20, 30 years. For example, if now part of stimulus packages would be to invest in a lot of infrastructure, and this is infrastructure that relies on, on fossil fuels in many ways, then we'll lock ourselves in for 30, 60, 70, up to 100 years, because that's how long we usually use infrastructure. So this is a very, very crucial moment, um, and we have to see. Um, where basically where money is being distributed to to deal with the situation of the crisis and there are, i mean there are alternative uh, approaches to the to the situation um, instead of just preserving everything that's suffering right now mm-hmm. oh. so yeah. you mentioned that um, um sorry jeremy yeah i, I wanted to interject um that uh, when you say that um um that certain industries have to, uh, have to be uh, closed should be closed down or it's an opportunity to close down what are the possibilities um, for uh, people working in those industries that might have uh, as you mentioned have a have a uh, yeah um, a rational fear that uh, they're going to lose their li- livelihoods are there any suggestions uh, about how to uh, mitigate uh, those circumstances or to to uh, yeah mm-hmm. to think about their interests as well as the interests of the environment Right, and I think we, we have to think about the interests of these people. We have to think about the interests of the people working in the automotive industry here or in the, um, in the coal mines, because if we don't, then we'll, you know, we get the bill next election. Um, and yes, of course. I mean, one thing is, of course, that if we look at the comparison between the jobs that are related to um, fossil fuel industry compared to the jobs that are related to renewables, there is much more jobs in renewables. So it's much more labor intense. That also makes the whole thing um, in many ways more expensive. At the same time, we, 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 it makes it also cheaper. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, of course, it's complex, right? <laughs> what I mean by that is that um, um, fossil fuels have a lot of costs that we usually don't take into the equation. Fossil fuels are subsidized. Yes, they're subsidized by tax money that directly goes into into infrastructure that directly goes into the companies, but they're also in many ways subsidized um, that are not that clear. So the first one, of course, is pollution. We let a lot of companies, um, not a lot, actually a handful of companies, uh, spew out a lot of pollution. Uh, We know that uh, seven to eight million people every year die because of bad air. Many people die because they have indoors bad air, because they're cooking indoors, but a lot of people, especially in China, um, are dying um, uh, because of air pollution. But we also have very, very high numbers in the EU where we have a lot of um, illness that comes from air pollution, a lot of mortalities, people dying um, and morbidity, people are getting sick because of air pollution. 
Um, so that is, that is one thing where we have an indirect subsidy that goes to the, to the fossil fuel industry that um, would otherwise probably set free resources that could be used in other ways. Um, another thing is, of course, not only air pollution, we also have uh, noise pollution, uh, for example, with uh, automotive uh, um, yeah, transport that affects uh, people uh, in Europe a lot. Okay, so um, by basically closing down uh, the fossil fuel industry, we might also just create um, a lot of savings, but at the same time, we're also, uh, if we substitute this with, with alternatives, for example, renewables, we'll have new jobs. That's one thing. Another thing is that we maybe should think about uh, the economy in slightly different terms um, uh, and think about how we measure value and growth. Because um, if we, for example, now uh, start digging up a huge coal mine, um, that would be something that adds on paper to economic growth, even though it creates in, in the long run the, the environmental impacts, it creates the climate impacts, it creates the health impacts that we talked about, and um, we might have a completely ruined landscape afterwards. Um, uh, so these costs need to be taken into consideration. But that is then, if we look at, at, the, at the papers, these costs are not taken into consideration. We see there's a lot of money made, so that's growth. Though there are alternative concepts that we could focus on. First thing is, of course, to focus on degrowth, which or other kinds of growth. Um, so saying, okay, maybe it may make sense for our economies um, and but to measure the success of our economies and to measure the success of our countries, not in terms of GDP, but in alternative measures. There's, for example, the Human Development Index that could be taken into consideration. And if we, for example, take that, we would see that, yeah, well, for example, the US, um, even though it experienced economic growth in the last years, it has at the same time in, uh, experienced increased um, child mortality. It has uh, experienced lower life expectancies and so on so if if we would change our way how we measure success of an economy that would be already a first step to really understanding that um, maybe just taking these steps is a good thing for society as such still it doesn't help with the jobs that are being lost in the fossil fuel industry but another thing would be maybe a focus on what we in economic circles call the foundational economy meaning we don't focus on these big companies that produce some things. We don't focus on these big fossil fuel producers, but what we maybe focus on our communities. So we make sure that there are jobs in healthcare. We make sure that there are adequate jobs in education. Um, we don't try to only go for a, a false sense of efficiency um, of saying, well, now teachers can use, you know, electronic means in their education, so it's fine if there are 35 students in their class instead of 15. Um, so a focus on these aspects could also be something that might create a lot of jobs. So then if we think about the, um, you briefly mentioned them already, the economic stimulus packages, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're obviously targeted at, at stabilizing and stimulating an economy that is uh, not at all based yet on these alternative ideas of growth. Do you in any way see um, the economic stimulus packages as they are being pushed through now and presented as a solution now? Do you actually see them contributing to uh, any form of more sustainable world than we were before this crisis hit? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I have to say I'm positively surprised. Um, I, it's far from being in any way sufficient. It's far from, you know, what I dreamt of. Um, but I have to say I'm positively surprised. The first thing was, of course, the European Commission um, saying, well, we're going to go on with really, really big stimulus packages and saying at least articulating the ambition that this is going to be green. If it will be green in the end, that will be the result of a lot of um, negotiations but it's great that they make this uh, ambition explicit right from the beginning. How much money um, there will be in this and how this is going to um, work out in the end remains to be seen, but I think I see the ambition and that's good. The biggest surprise though was, um, I have to say, when the stimulus package of Germany was announced. 
because the first crisis response in 2008 was, even though we knew that we were in the middle of a climate crisis, the first and, and, and most central aspect of that package was uh, a subsidy for people buying new cars. Um, this, even though it has been discussed, and even though there were a lot of people, and of course the automotive lobby in Germany, um, which is extremely strong, has historically been extremely strong, been very much pushing for it, it was on the table, it didn't make it into the stimulus package. And I find that very encouraging, I have to say. Um, again, the German package is not in any way sufficient in terms of what we would need for a, a, a proper sustainability transition. But these two aspects do indeed give me hope. Though, I mean, EU and uh, Germany uh, will not be, you know, as, as, as the only players will not be in any way uh, able to avert dangerous climate change. But it's good to see that, at least. Yeah, yeah you mentioned the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, that's not so long ago. Um, mm. And at the moment, where many uh, look at the corona crisis even more, uh, they consider it even more an economic crisis and a health crisis in some, some cases. And I'm just yeah. wondering if the last economic crisis or financial crisis was not so long ago, um, how at the time did that affect the sustainability crisis and what can we learn from how things happened then? Um, mm. I, I, as I said, like one of the key aspects is, is the question of how the stimulus package will look like. Um, that is one thing. Um, another thing is that we see in times of crisis often a scramble for resources, that you go um, and try to secure certain resources. So I think um, land grabbing was a thing that then, so the, the, the big scale land procurement was a thing that then happened after the, the crisis uh, back then that, for example, investors go and buy a lot of uh, land in um, poor areas of the world, um, often displacing local population, often affecting biodiversity. If then this land is, you know, put on the duct of use, whatever that is. Um, so that is, that is one thing. And, and of course, there we, we have to be on guard a little bit. Um, but of course, we also see that uh, states uh, see when they have an economic downturn, um, governments see that they have to react to that. And then one thing that can happen is, of course, a, a, a pillaging of the natural resources of a country. That you would then go and say, well, okay, this was a national park and this was really important and everything, but right now people are starving and we need jobs. And um, so we open up this piece of the Amazonian rainforest for, you know, a slash and burn and um, uh, extractivist industries. So this, this uh, response of going into extractivist practices, trying to get resources out of the ground, uh, harvesting uh, natural resources that are there, that is also something we need to be careful that we don't fall into this trap. Yeah, and I believe that some of these things are already happening in, in the US, right? Some, some, uh, there have been more, um, more ambitious um, legislations on reducing the emissions of CO2 and reducing uh, mm. fracking and, uh, and sand oils. Um, and now under current conditions, um, you see these disappear. You can yeah. see them being loosened. So we can yeah. already see, actually, right now, that governments are actually responding uh, with more extractivist uh, means. Exactly. Exactly. Brazil is, a, is another example um, where we, of course, in basically since the election of Bolsonaro, have seen a full-fledged attack on the, on the Amazon rainforest. Um, I don't think that this is going to be any better um, uh, in a couple of months with corona still raging. Mm -hmm. So yeah. again, it very much depends on how your government responds to that situation. Yeah, yeah. hope government's listening. Yeah. Um, so, but then looking at things that governments do or mm -hmm. have proposed actually already before the corona crisis, like the European Green Deal, deal mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the Green yeah. New Deal <laughs> uh, in the US. Uh, there's a bunch of them and um, they were proposed before the crisis. Um, how do you see this? Is this in any way affected or changed by the Corona crisis? Because I mean, this was a deal that was set before, like 
um, commitments have been made. Also in the Netherlands, mm-hmm. the Netherlands has committed uh, to Urgenda's uh, um, uh, proposition to reduce greenhouse gases by 25%. The commitments yeah. have been made. There's this, this saying, and I think it comes from a US president, if I'm not mistaken, about the Eisenhower, but I'm not 100% sure, saying, well, um, you know, never miss a good crisis. Never miss the chances that come with a good crisis, of course. Um, so it's, it's sure, um, the crisis opens up a window of opportunity. We are doing a situation of crisis um, able to impose certain things on people. To um, we see that people are willing to adapt their lifestyles in many ways. Um, the only danger that I see is that with the Corona crisis, we're living in this narrative of now we have crisis, and in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months, crisis is over and we go back to normal. Um, and this is also a fundamental difference between the Corona crisis and the climate crisis. Because with the climate crisis, it's not that we go through a a certain period and then we'll be back at normal. Like, nobody knows what that new normal can look like in detail uh, of a decarbonized uh, society. So, um, yeah, what was your question again? (laughs) (laughs) How this, so basically, so commitments have been made, right? So like uh, the European Green Deal and now, as you say, uh, we, are, we are in a different crisis that um, creates, on the one hand, more willingness to change things. On the other hand, yeah. it's also used as a good excuse. Uh, in the same line as never waste a good crisis, it's used as an excuse to push forward other things or to get rid of legislation that was actually uh, yeah. um, that was actually for the environmental project. So you can just you can see how uh, again how this crisis can be used as a as an encouragement to make changes um, for the better. Yeah. Well, at the same time, it's, it's very easily used to kind of um, disguise, maybe, yeah. um, changes. Well, that's every, every, everybody can make use of a good crisis, right? <laughs> <laughs> can be used for good, can be used for bad, I guess. Yeah, yeah so um, I don't know. How do you think about that? Um, well, as I, as I mentioned, I, I think in as looking at the U.S., it's mostly been used as a way to, um, to distract I think to distract many eyes from um, getting rid of legislation that was actually very yeah. good and getting away with bailouts um, that would otherwise not happen. Yeah. Um, so that is something that I, that I, can, I can worry about, um, definitely, mm. um, and could actually be a waste of a, of a chance to get through this crisis um, yeah. uh, much more sustainably because we have, I mean, we've seen how rapidly we can make changes. Right. If only there are so many systemic changes that um, that the climate crisis requires um, that have not happened. Right. We've been talking about this for decades, about the systemic change that should happen. And now within a matter of weeks, uh, we can we can live in a way that actually also um, reduces CO2 emission by a pace that would actually that we would actually require if we are to meet the one and a half degrees heating. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that our world would look like this. That's how, how it's often been, been twisted. Like if, um, if we want to actually, um, li- if we want to keep up this one and a half degrees of heating, this is what our lives will look like forever. This is what mobility will look like forever. That's not yeah. true. Um, but I think it does prove that um, we can make very, very deep changes in a very short time. I, th- I think, I, I, yeah, um, you go. Yeah, I think maybe if we look at uh, not so much at, how governments are responding to the crisis, uh, which, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Hannah, uh, some uh, right-wing governments might re- might respond uh, with a right- in a right-wing way, and more uh, left-wing governments might uh, might uh, choose their uh, their social pro- programs that they would like to pick, uh, would have liked to push through anyway. Um, but it might also be interesting to take a step back and look at how people's mentality might uh, might be changing or uh, look at people's subjectivity how how what is the impact of um people finally seeing a uh, a government taking uh, or governments taking massive massive uh um uh, gig- yeah, policy uh, changes in a really short time that are really invasive into people's daily lives, doing it for the for the public good. Um, 
what does what does it uh, change in our way we we look at ourselves as individuals and our uh, our roles as uh, individuals in society and at the mm. role of of government in uh, tackling these kind of large scale problems. So I think maybe um, if you take a step back and think about what this might do in the medium term to how we how our um, how we look at the possibilities for change. I think that might be really interesting. Um, finally, we, we see the possibility, okay, governments can do these kind of things. Um, what do we want them to do now? <laughs> they can't say, well, this is uh, too much. Uh, we can't do this. So we know uh, it's the market. There is no solve. money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the magic money tree won't, uh, won't solve your problems. I mean, all these excuses can just be tossed out the window and you can point to what about Corona? Why did you do, how, how come you could do it then? What about, uh, what about climate change? Mm -hmm. The impacts are going to be so much larger. So I think that this is, um, this is something that, that, that can't be overlooked. Maybe governments aren't doing the right thing right now, but we can damn well um, make them do uh, the proper things in the immediate future. Well said, Jeremy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It will require one thing, and that's the one thing that Greta Thunberg tries to, to hammer home, treat the crisis as a crisis. Um, and that's, of course, the difficulty. I mean, that's the difference with, with Corona and, and the, this is the second difference between Corona and the climate crisis. This is also one, one more point where I think it's, it's, it's a bit off to compare the two. I mean, the first one is, of course, with Corona, we, can, we could go back to normal. With the climate crisis, we can't. But the second one also being Corona is now. People are dying now. And of course, there are people already dying now from the climate crisis, but it's not as direct. It's very, it's very indirect. It's through natural disasters. It's through very, a lot of abstract steps um, that we can assign uh, human suffering directly to climate change. And also probably because those who are suffering, though and indirectly, are not most often from the global north. Yes. Consequences are very far away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I just read today that the estimate is that the, um, the hurricane that ravaged Houston, when was that two years ago, three mm -hmm. years ago, uh, uh, that costs of what, 67 billion US dollars could be assigned to climate change in that case. So um, I think we're coming very much to a point where no, it's, it's not only those small-scale farmers in Africa that are suffering now. Uh, we had uh, this situation of early warnings in, in May that this year might be an extreme drought year again for Europe um, that might affect European farmers a lot um, and food security uh, eventually in Europe. So I think we're coming to, to a point where also it, it starts hitting closer to home. Um, though it's still quite abstract. With Corona, it's quite straightforward, right? I mean, you get a fever, <laughs> can't breathe, you die. <laughs> that's, that's very tangible. Uh, it's very tangible if your grandmother, or it, it becomes very tangible when, when, when my, my parents are past 70, when they are, you know, I think of them now as risk group. That makes Corona much more tangible for me than you know, climate change at this point. Yeah. Henner, are there any lessons that we can um, we can take from this corona crisis about how we are or how we are not dealing with the climate mm. crisis? What to you is most maybe most painful and confronting, but maybe also the most um, hopeful? Um, I think one thing is that um, resistance, at least in Europe, uh, to the measures has been loud but it hasn't been that many people i mean most people accept the measures that are happening so if you have an understanding in a population uh, in a country that this is a serious problem and people are okay with measures even if they affect um, their lives quite drastically um, and even though again then the problem of the time perspective feeds into this i i still think that is that is one thing that can make us hopeful as I said, I'm positively surprised by some of the stimulus packages we've seen. Um, the debate in, in or, or the, the stimulus package in Germany, the one by the EU, but also the debate in the UK um, 
where Boris Johnson is being pushed a lot to make this a climate package. That is encouraging. Um, I think that for a lot of people, this was also a chance to think a little bit about what, what kind of lifestyle do I want? What kind of life do I want? Um, how do I want to live my life? And for many people, that also meant that it is okay to consume less. I don't think that this might be like the big game changer in terms of sustainability. This is not going to be the big game changer in terms of climate change, but I think it might be um, for individual, uh, the individual situation of mostly very privileged people, this might be a thing that might increase their life uh, quality, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jeremy, do you have any questions that you still like to ask um, Hello. Well, I, w I was wondering uh, one thing about um, the transition um, mm -hmm. in, 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 different, uh, in the different policy proposals uh, that, that we've been talking about, the, the Green Deal in UK or in the EU and the yeah. Green New Deal in the US. Um, so what, um, if I'm, a, if I'm a, a worker in the auto industry or uh, in, the, uh, in the aviation industry, um, and uh, um, there's lots of talk about yeah, there's lots of jobs in uh, in the, in this new budding uh, green uh, green industry. Yeah. Uh, I might think yeah, great, but uh, I've been uh, I've been in this industry in this industry for uh, for years. I'm not schooled in these things. Uh, how the hell am I going to uh, find a job uh, in these other other places? Yeah. Uh, how how are they? Uh, how are these people being uh, taken into account? Um, within these policies? Yeah, um, that is a crucial question. That is a, that's an absolute crucial question. And if we look into the discussions about the so-called just transition, um, um, and these are, of course, political debates that are being held, but also very much academic discussions. Um, but these are also things that, that, that are driven by trade unions, that are driven by NGOs. I think there's a lot of answers that we can find. Um, we see um, a lot of successes in Spain, where the Spanish government has really dedicated a lot of resources towards facilitating a just transition. When they closed down the coal mines, they didn't just close down the coal mines, but they also focused very much on the people that are working in the coal mines and offering them education, um, offering them other possibilities, putting up uh, programs um, to, you know, create a vision for how these people can live their lives. Um, and that I think is crucial. Um, and I think this is also a thing that, that sustainability teaches us at the core of sustainability is the human um, uh, and, and making sure that in any sustainability transition, we don't only focus on, you know, emissions, but we also focus on, on, on the question of human livelihoods, human existences, human identity behind that, that is crucial. So I think that there, there is some, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening around this, this, um, buzzword of the green of the of the just transition uh, interesting work that's happening in south africa which also has a humongous uh, mining sector mm. um, so it very much is a question of how do governments take this up what do they focus on and i said again um, the foundational economy that i mentioned earlier these concepts um, a, a constructive engagement with the ideas of degrowth all that is something where we can find a lot of answers yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anything that you still like to share with us, Henry, before we um, before you wrap up? I think I waffled a lot, so I, <laughs> uh, I, I, I now. I mean, it's tough right now. I think I think one thing that is that is very important is that we are um, that we are nice to each other right now uh, in the way how we we have to be firm uh, in how we discuss but we also have to be kind and nice because people are afraid um, people are afraid of losing their jobs people are afraid of losing their livelihoods and losing their identities and that is that's existential um, so yeah be kind to each other but be firm in in you know your points
Good. Thank you so much for um, being uh, on the show, Henner. It was, it was great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Um, do you like what you see and what you hear? Um, it would help us tremendously if you follow us on Twitter, if you like and subscribe us on YouTube, leave a review on uh, whatever podcast um, channel that you use. Um, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook and of course invite your friends and your family um, to watch us as well. That would be a great help for us. Um, Jeremy, what did you think of today? Yeah, I was uh, yeah really interested to hear uh, what uh, what Hannah had to say. Um, yeah, it was a great talk. Um, I'd like to uh, yeah um, um, remind people of all the uh, amazing um, things uh, and actions and organizations that uh, that we have here in the Netherlands that are doing really important work to put some of the ideas that we uh, we have talked about today into into practice. Um, so uh, people, yeah, we talked a bit about the degrowth. There's a big degrowth movement in in Holland, um, but also um, people um, on the on the barricades, um, blocking, uh, taking down a shell, blocking their uh, um, um, climate over their 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 annual conference. Uh, Code Rood has uh, been doing really uh, really important work uh, within the um, uh, shell must fall campaign. Uh, amongst other uh, amongst other organizations uh, of course uh, extension rebellion uh, um, is uh, yeah bringing lots of new people into the uh, into the climate movement uh, I, in the beginning i was uh, of course critical of their stance on uh, nonviolence that doesn't mean that they're not doing uh, important work but uh, that we shouldn't work uh, together with uh, these people but uh, yeah um, there are lots of different ways to uh, to achieve change and it's important to keep in mind that we that we need each other, that we need to use different uh, ways of doing actions from uh, uh, from yeah changing policy in the, in the in the local government to the national government government to uh, street actions on the streets and petitions and uh, maybe uh, yeah looking at uh, the events in <laughs> in the U.S. seeing how how mass uh, mass participation and militant action can really change change the overtone vi window of what's possible. So yeah, keep that in mind when uh, when you think about joining uh, an action next time, sometime in the future. Yeah. Great, thank you for today, Jeremy, uh, and uh, we hope to see everyone soon.